Then Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put at his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, there are generational blessings that come down to our lives. And, and sometimes we find ourselves in a period of grace. And it, it hasn't got anything to do, really, about our prayer life or our desire or our devotion. It's just that God somewhere promised somebody in your line in your family line or in your spiritual line, that he would do a certain thing and that you were just privileged enough just to be in the right place at the right time, born into that line in the right season, and you receive blessing from God that you didn't ask for and maybe didn't even deserve. And that's how, that's how committed God is to his covenants. That's how much God is committed to the spoken word into a person's life. People ask me sometimes, Ken, what did you do to get a move of God? And I've got people who study me as to how you get a move of God. I know there's a certain church here in America, and I get grilled by the pastor all the time. And then... Did you get a sign about this? And did you, did you have a dream about this? And was there a change in the atmosphere prior to it? Or did it just suddenly come right out of the blue without any announcement or, or whatever? And, and what he's trying to do, he's trying to generate similar circumstances in order that, and I admire him for it, in order that he can have what happened to us in Sunderland. I haven't had the courage to tell him it doesn't actually happen like that. Because <laughs> I just feel, you know, that it might be that God just does honor him. And, and so I don't want to burst his bubble at all. I don't want to say, well, you know, it might not happen. Because it just might. Because God's sovereign at the end of the day, isn't he? And I'm here to tell you that I didn't pray in renewal, revival, move of God. I didn't spend weeks and months crying out to God and, and saying to God that I would never be satisfied unless a thousand people were coming to my, to my church every single night from, from the nations of Europe. It just happened. And I just feel very privileged that that, that God took a hold. My daughter was preaching because it was um, uh, Mother's Day on Sunday. She was asked to preach at her church in Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, so she preached at the 8 o'clock and then she preached at the 10 o'clock. And I, and I was listening to it this afternoon because they you stream it. And, uh, and so I was able to, to watch it as, a, as an archive over the internet. And I was very, very proud of her. I was bursting with pride. Because actually, I wondered why, how come they got her to preach? Because she never preached for me, you know. <laughs> I would ask her to do things. And she's a very confident young lady. And she's not phased by holding a microphone and talking. She kind of wanders a little bit, you know, and just kind of, you know. <laughs> but, um, but, and she admits that herself. She says, if I'm just wandering off, just bring me back in, you know, and tell me where I, I was. And, uh, but, you know, she, she spoke of, of us as her parents. And she spoke of those days. And she was 16 at the, at the time. And, uh, you know, she, she talked about the impact that it had. And, but she didn't talk about us spending nights and nights in prayer and 
believe in God because we simply didn't. I probably have told you this before, but I believe that I am a product of generational blessing. That's what I believe I'm a product of. And uh, my grandfather died at 35 years old of stomach cancer. So I, I obviously never knew him. He was, uh, my mother was only six years old when he died. She had a younger brother, three, and an older brother, nine. And the older brother that was nine, it was special needs. And uh, it was wartime, and, and uh, she remembers my grandmother taking, um, taking the children out of the house, deliberately standing them on the, outs on the outside, and praying that a Nazi bomb would come and drop and just take them all to heaven so that she could go to heaven to be with her husband and the kids could go as well because it was just so hard and so difficult. Now that could have happened. But except, <laughs> I think there was a promise in the generational line and so it could not happen. There was no way that it could happen because you've probably worked it out already that if my mother had been killed by a bomb, then guess what? Yeah, I'm not even a memory, you know. Uh, yeah, there's like, no, I'm not here. So it didn't happen, and, and you know, the, all the kids grew, and of course my mother married my dad, and here I am. And I never knew my grandfather at all, but I heard little stories about him. I heard that he loved the presence. I heard that he loved the glory of God. And not only that, but he'd experienced. See, we had a, a revival at the turn of the century through an Anglican priest called Alexander Body. And it was the time of Azusa Street. It was the time of Wales. And, uh, and this priest, looking out over his parish, which was very, very poor, went to Wales and concluded that the only answer to his parish was what was happening in Wales. That he needed a revival. Nothing else would fix this. And so he went to Wales and he stood with Evan Roberts on the platform and he asked for an impartation and he came back and he invited a guy, an Englishman from Oslo, Norway, I think it was called Christiana in those days, asked him to come over, and he came over. You know, I don't know how they communicated in those days, you know. When you think, all you got to do is text them now, you know, around the world, just say, will you come and preach? Yeah, and it's done in two seconds. <laughs> he had to send a letter, and it would go by boat, and then he had to wait for the letter to come back, and it said, yes, I'll come. And then he sends another letter, and says, when are, you, when are you free? And then he comes another letter with dates, and he says, well, we can think around that. And I mean, it probably took about a year to set it up. But he arrived on a boat from Norway into Sunderland Harbor. And the bishop would not allow him to have the meetings in the church because it was Anglican, but he could have the church hall, All Saints Church Hall on Fulwell Road, Sunderland. And he started having nightly meetings there. Wigglesworth came up to that revival and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But... People came from a mining village in Scotland called Kilsyth. And they traveled to the revival in order to take it back. And when they went back, an outpouring happened. Not as big as Sunderland, but an outpouring happened. The result of it was that a church grew up there and, and, and became very Pentecostal and very charismatic, and very spirit-filled. It was the church that my grandfather went to. And my mother, when she was 20 years old, came down to our region because, you know, you did certain things. If you had a choir, you would send the choir to another church and things like that. And she came down and met my father and they fell in love and, he, and she married him. And never went back. And so we, we have this link in revival 
Kilsyth Sundland. And now we have my family linking it through marriage. Now, it's either weird, a coincidence, or it's very God. Because he has a purpose and a destiny to do something. I think I'll go for the latter. I think I'll just accept the fact that God arranged all of that. Everything, even the details, everything in order to do something in my life. Now, it sounds very arrogant to say that. But if I'm saying it about me, you know, the same God rearranges things and arranges things for you also. That's why the Bible says that he has prepared for us good works in advance for us to do. They're there waiting. And they're generational blessings, some of them. Some of them are prophetic words. Some of them are your own dreams and your own aspirations. But they're there. They're set in time and place in order that you can just divinely stumble over them and fulfill them to the glory of God. Good works in advance for you to do. That's why your future and your destiny, well, your destiny, your future definitely is ahead of you, but your destiny and the purposes of God are there yet to be discovered and fulfilled. That's why we can always say my greatest days have yet to come. They're still ahead of me. My grandfather, before he died, had glory meetings. And he wrote in the back of his Bible, the Spirit of God was so strong tonight. The glory came down. We were there and didn't leave the church till 2 a.m. in the morning. It's in the back of his Bible. So even though I didn't know him, I, I didn't know him physically. I never got to know him. He died, you know, when my mother was only six. Yet, I feel I know him. Now that's either weird or it's God as well. I'll take it, it's God. And I feel that he just, he loved the things I love. Or I love. I, I think he hungered for the things that I hunger for. I, I, I think he desired the things that I desire. He was a coal miner. Two o'clock in the morning, six, he would have to be in the pit, mining coal. I've read his Bible, and I have a feeling that when he knew he was going to die, I have a feeling that he might have asked the Lord, if you're taking me home, Put a revivalist in my life. And God made a promise. So even though my grandmother tried to kill the whole family with a Nazi bomb, it was never going to happen. She, she could never succeed. And I'm eternally grateful for that. So when the revival came to Sunderland, the one that I was hosting and involved in, I didn't do a thing about it. I think it just came straight from my grandfather's desire to see revival in his lifetime, his prayers, his desire, and everything else. And because that was not going to be fulfilled, he just asked that it would be through somebody else. And I just feel so privileged. That was something my daughter was just talking about at her church as she was speaking and, and preaching on Mother's Day. It just reminded me of that. See, Jacob was a man of, of destiny. He had promise. He was one of the patriarchs. He was serving the God of Abraham and all the promises of Abraham. And God says this to him, as I promised Abraham, I'm now promising you as I promised Isaac, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and all the covenant promises were coming down into his life. But you know, something else can come down as well. If, if blessing comes down, guess what else can come down? Hello? <laughs> Curses. The thing is, the devil can curse to the third and fourth generation, but God blesses to a thousand generations. <laughs> huh. 
He might have a goal, but it's limited. But when God blesses, it goes on and on and on. And I'm thinking, my goodness, I'm just like third generation. This blessing goes to a thousand generations. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, my kids who are in ministry will see moves of God. They will see revival. They will see, you know, God moving by spirit. And, 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 and I couldn't try to stop it, but it would be stupid to do so because it's there. You know, there's nothing I can do because the promise has been made and we serve a covenant-keeping God who keeps his promises. He, he is the yes and amen. Hallelujah. So I, Jacob has these promises, but he also has some curses running through as well. You know, I'm paraphrasing just for time, but if you backed it up to the point where he was living in the household with Isaac and Rebekah with his brother Esau, you will read a scripture there which is almost hard to believe. And that scripture says that, that Rebekah loved Jacob, but Isaac loved Esau because he ate his meat. Now, how stupid is that? <laughs> that you decide you're going to love one of the sons more than the other because you're a meat eater. Because you like the game that he's bringing or the meat that he's bringing, the stew that he's making or the tenderloin that he's preparing or whatever. You, that's what you like. Now, I just read that and skimmed over it, and, and I've read it a thousand, and then I just read it one day, and I thought, that is so ridiculous, to put your love on one of your sons because you like his meat. Now, there's something wrong there. And then it says that Rebecca loved um, Jacob because um, he dwelt among the tents, and he was this mild-mannered kind of guy, you know, and, uh, and he just was helpful. And so there's something not right here. There is the producing of a very dysfunctional family, and yet here we have the patriarchal family, the family that God is going to establish the nation of Israel through are, are now splitting their kids up, and you've got this whole dysfunctional thing happening, and it work, it pans itself out to the degree that actually Esau and Jacob have to separate. And it's all down to the parents. They have to separate. And so there's a curse, a, generation, a generational iniquity working down through. See, Esau had it from his father, and, and, and he just had this appetite for meat, like his dad. And as a result of that, it was a carnal thing. It wasn't just, oh, and now and again, I like a steak. Actually, it was like a drug to them. They needed it. And if they didn't have it, they would do all to get it. And so what do you have? You have Esau losing his birthright because of it. And he loses the blessing because of it. And Isaac himself gives the blessing in the birthright, or gives the blessing to the wrong boy because of the iniquity. Think about it. And then on the other side, Rebecca causes Jacob to manipulate and lie and cheat because down through her line, that's the iniquity working down through. You see that in Laban, her brother. When Jacob gets to that household, I mean, he's just taken for a ride. And so as much as I want the blessing, hallelujah, I want to stop the cursing. I want to stop it with me. I don't want it going to my kids. I don't want it going to my grandkids. I want to stop it here with me. And you know, all you have to do is just stop it. It's no big deal. All you have to do is just say, it stops here with me. But that, that blessing thing, that can travel down for another thousand generations. 
Because if you don't stop it, you get what we've got here, separation. And Isaac is on the run. He's now got a brother, a twin brother that wants to kill him. Actually, he wants to put him to death. And that's why he's sent to his uncle Laban. For safety, for security. Now man is trying to kind of be protective here. The family are trying to do what's right. So they're trying to make something good out of a bad start. But God has it all mapped out anyway. And it says he comes to a certain place. I love the Bible, you know, when it just says things like this. Because that certain place could be anywhere. Couldn't it? It's just a certain place. It could be here tonight. You know, you could have arrived at a certain place. It's called Harvest Time Church. It's a Monday night. This English guy's preaching. But God can make it a certain place just for you. And what God did here was there was nothing special about it. It was God that made it a certain place. God purpose, God destined it to be and just spoke it out. And that's why the Bible records that, that Isaac just, and Jacob comes to a, I wish they were called Tom, Dick and Harry. Do you? It wouldn't have made it much easier. And then when you're preaching about Elijah and Elisha, I mean, good grief, you know. <laughs> and I'm going to believe that tonight is a certain place for you. Because when you arrive at these certain places, I want to tell you, you arrive at the best place that you could ever arrive at. Why? Well, because when you arrive at that place, heaven opens. It says he stayed there all night. Because the sun had set and he was just tired. So it's just a natural thing. I'm going to go to sleep. But he didn't realize it was a certain place. And sometimes you can be doing the most natural things. And you think you're just going to do it. But you've arrived at a certain place. And stayed there all night because the sun had set. <coughs> and he took... One of the stones of that place, and he put it at his head, so he makes it a pillow. And he lay down in that place to sleep. But it's a certain place. So it's not just that place. It's a certain place. Are you with me? I might have to say that a, a, few, a few times more. Because you really got to get it in your heart and your spirit. That these places... They're everywhere. We're creating, or God's creating a certain place tonight, but guess what? Tomorrow you could have another one. And next week there might be another one still because they're littered all over. They're all over your life. Certain places where God wants to meet with you, impact your life, change you forever, open heaven, heaven touching earth. That's God. He wants to take the mundane out of your life. He wants to take the ordinary out of your life. He wants to take the predictable out of your life. And he wants you to stumble from certain place to certain place to certain place. Huh? Your Tom Tom hasn't a clue where it's going to take you. You can type in a certain place. Ordained by God and it'll go, what? There's no right turn. There's no left turn. There's no stop here. Go there. It's just life. It's life in God. I've got a thousand. Have you got time? <laughs> when I went to Holy Trinity Brompton in, in June 1994, I stumbled into a certain place. And it all set up. Heaven opened. Angels descending and, and ascending. And, and it was the house of God. And God was in that place. And I didn't even know it. And then I went from there and I, I went to another certain place called uh, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. 
and heaven opened. And a ladder went from earth to heaven and angels ascended and des descended. And, and, and then I went to another place. Sunderland, my hometown, my own church. I thought a Sunday morning meeting prepared, you know, for us to share and just come back from Toronto. But it was a certain place. And the heavens opened and we stayed there for three and a half years. And then out of that certain place, I went around the world. And I found certain places that God had set up for me. All over the world. Hallelujah. Pensacola. Argentina. Colombia. Malaysia. Singapore. Australia. New Zealand. Holland. Germany. All over the world, certain places. I didn't have to go all over the world to find them. That was my certain places. But your certain places are just as real. They might not be in these other nations and countries, but they're there for you to find. Yeah. And, and your life is leaving one and finding another. And then leaving that one and finding another. And leaving that one and finding another. When I was here on Mother's Day last year, I thought I was coming to preach for Pastor Glenn Harvison that I had never, ever met. I didn't realize he was such a nice guy. I just thought, I'm going to, I'm going to preach for this pastor. People told me he was a nice guy, but I'd, I didn't want to believe it until I'd, <laughs> until I'd met him myself. Because I thought, well, you say that about everybody. But then when I met him, I found out it was true. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> but, but God just made it a certain place. Not for me, but for him. And for the people of this church. When you arrive at a certain place, you arrive at a point of your destiny. Not to stay there forever. But to find another, because it's another step into your destiny. Isn't that fantastic? And the thing is, we don't have to stress about it, because it's all done. It was done before creation even happened. Before time existed, these certain places were put out for you just to walk from one to another. I'd like to think as you walk from one to another, you go from one level of glory to another level of glory. You go to, from one measure of blessing to another measure of blessing. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to the heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. And then he repeats the promise that Abraham heard and Isaac heard, and now Jacob is hearing the same promise. If we go to verse 16, it says that he woke up. So this was a night vision. Who would like night visions? Six. <laughs> Who would like to go to sleep and, and have a night vision and, and, and experience something like this? Come on. You know, there are certain things you can do. And there are certain things that you shouldn't do. For instance, if you want that as part of your life, I just release it now in the name of Jesus. I just release night visions to each and every one of you in Jesus' name. Dreams from heaven. Now, one thing you shouldn't do if you're really certain and honest about that is watch a horror movie just before you go to sleep. Because you'll get a different kind of vision. You might get one from hell. I wouldn't even watch a kind of anything that stresses you at all. I wouldn't even, try not even putting the TV on. 
so that it's the last thing you hear or see before you go to sleep. Ah. I've got a couple um, great friends. They, they lead Catch the Fire London, and uh, that's a church. And they're also responsible for Catch the Fire Europe. They're great people. They're just a young couple. He's only 39. She's younger. And uh, she received a, a miraculous healing. That's another story. We'll move on. But, but they told me just, just last week, I was up in Toronto with them, just, and they told me that actually what they do is they prepare themselves for night visions. And you know one of the things that they do? Not immediately they go to sleep, but sometime in the evening, they put on like these comedy things, you know, like the Three Stooges or something like that, you know. They, they put on like something that would make them laugh. And they just laugh. Oh, no, and they put on um, these things, you know, when, you, when, when um, you play tricks on people and it's all filmed, you know, and uh, what's it called? Just for laughs. It's all on YouTube, apparently. They said they just go there just for laughs. And they just laugh. And they deliberately, they deliberately raise their joy base as a deliberate preparation for the Lord to do something in their sleep. And I just thought, that's fantastic. Because, you know, if you're miserable, you probably won't get a, light, a night vision. You know what I mean? You probably, the Lord's just saying, well, I'll just let you get over your misery first. And then when you're a little bit more joyful, I'll come and give you something. You know, the, the, the life in the spirit is a happy life. I mean, we've got the best brand you could ever sell anybody. Why wouldn't anybody want this? I mean, we just laugh all the time. We laugh at ourselves. We laugh at each other, you know, and it's just, you know, to be spirit-filled in a Christian is just hilarious, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> I don't just know I'm sure about that lot over there. So I release it now, but cut out the movies, cut out the thrillers and the murder mysteries and all of that just before you go to sleep and prepare your spirit, prepare your heart and just by faith, go for it. I mean, there have been times when I've put my head on my pillow in a hotel room, miserable because I'm on my own, not this hotel, by the way, no, this is what, very nice, very nice. You have nice hotels in Connecticut. I just want to just dig in a hole and trying to get myself out of it. I love hotel rooms. I love it. Okay, but sometimes I'm going to sleep and I'll deliberately say, Lord, you know what would be nice tonight? Father, Daddy, God, you know what I'd really like? Something from you in the night. Just a secret from your heart. Just a treasure. And I, I kind of tell you the amount of times God just out of his goodness just answers that. Sometimes it takes me a little while to realize that I've actually had one, you know, because I get up and get busy, and then I think, well, I'm having, whoa, hang on. Has that ever happened to you? It's just like, whoa, that was, that was like from God. That wasn't just one of those crazy dreams, you know, like a piece of meat that you ate at, late at night or something like that. This was like really the Lord. And you can have the same. I'll tell you this. My, you know, I told you this before, but it's worth telling again. Have we got time? Have we got a few minutes, huh? Okay. Because I haven't even started preaching yet, really. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's all right. You're a chef. You're used to late nights. See? Yeah, you're conditioned for it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when, uh, we were instructed to, by the Lord to buy the house of prayer. You know, you know the story that Lois told us I had to buy it? Well, anyway, we're, we're at the stoplights, and there's just my wife and I in the car, and she looks at this derelict church, and she says, can you need to buy that? And I said, it's derelict. And I knew it had been derelict for seven years. There were only pigeons in there, <laughs> and, and whatever, rats, mice, whatever would be in there. 
I mean, that's all. It was terrible. And she says, no, you need to buy it. And so, you know, you say to your wife, why? <laughs> and they don't feel they have to tell you. <laughs> it's like, it's irrelevant. <laughs> why? It's almost like you asked a stupid question. Because she just says, well, I just don't know. I'm just telling you, you need to buy it. And so I phoned up the guy, and he said, it's sold. So I told my wife, it's sold. And so she said to me, did you ask him if it's really sold? <laughs> Glenn, have you ever worked this out? I mean, you've been married a few years, haven't you? I've never worked it out. I've only concluded that there's a piece of brain in a woman's head that men don't have. And that in that, in that piece of brain are all kinds of things. <laughs> and every now and again, they just come out. They open their mouth, and out it comes. And I just had to think, this is one of those occasions. Because actually, in a man's brain, there's no difference between sold and really sold. It's either sold or it's not. There's no such thing as this middle area called really sold. I said, Lois, the guy said it's sold. She says, but you didn't ask him if it was really sold. She says, Ken, you need to go back and you need to ask him, is it really sold? I said, okay. I'll do that. That's what I told her. But in my mind, I thought, this is why you have staff. <laughs> to get them to do things like this that you're embarrassed to do. So I got a staff member to phone up. And I said, remember, say this. I know it's sold. But is it really sold? And he looked at me. I should have asked a woman to do this. And he looked at me and, I, and he says, I've got to ask him, is it, I know it's sold, but is it really sold? I said, yeah, make sure, make sure you say the exact words. And you know, he did that. God bless his little heart. He, he phoned up and he says, I'm phoning on behalf of Pastor Ken Goth. You've already told him it's sold, but I have to ask you, is it really sold? And he said, well, actually, it is sold, but it's not really sold. <laughs> Can you believe that? Now I'm going to have to tell my wife this, and then I'm going to be subject to other things coming out of her head that make no sense to me whatsoever. And, and I says, what do you mean? What did he say? He says, well, they've said yes, and we've said yes, but no papers have been signed. So it's not really sold. Can you believe this? So I went to Lois and I said, it's sold, but it's not really sold. <laughs> and I told her the story that a Muslim group were buying the church and they wanted to turn it into a Muslim family center and they had permission for the pews to be removed and prayer mats to be put down. But they hadn't signed anything. So it's not really sold. She says, well, tell them we'll have it. So now I'm, I, I don't need the staff anymore. <laughs> that church... We'll have it. What's the price? We'll pay. And he said, no, no, it doesn't work like that. 9-11 doesn't work like that anymore. I know you're the Christians, and I know you're the church, and I know this is a church building, but I can't do it. I've got to give them equal opportunity. So he said, put a closed bid in an envelope. I'll tell them to do the same. Come down to my office Thursday at 12 noon. And that night, my wife had a night vision. 
See, sometimes they're just nice for you, but sometimes they change the whole direction of your life. That's what this was all about at Bethel. It was changing the whole direction. He's a fugitive on the run. He's escaping from a brother that wants to kill him. He's running for his life, but he came to a certain place and had a night vision. And it changed his life. Changed the whole direction of his destiny forever. And my wife had a dream. And in the dream, the whole thing is set up. And what she saw was actually their debate on what to put in the envelope as if she was in the very room. And in the room, she heard them say, the church are going to offer this. So if we offer a thousand pound more, we'll get it. So when she woke up, she said, Ken, I had this dream. They said, we're going to offer this. They're going to offer a thousand pound more. So offer a thousand pound more than that and we'll get it. So I said, so what's the number? <laughs> and she gave me the exact amount. The Lord in the night gave her the exact amount. Now, my wife's a woman that just reads your mail. You know, she is a, like a, a prophet. Uh, I'm a minor prophet. She's a major one. Okay. So, so, we wrote it down. And I sent down that same staff member because I wanted to reward him. And what if it's not right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so down he went. And the envelopes were opened. And it was everything my wife had seen in the dream. Everything. We opened up and our bid was 1,000 pound more than theirs. Exactly. Exactly. Ha! Ah. Woo! Ha ha! So they're worth having, aren't they? Right, now lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands. I release night visions and dreams in the name of Jesus. Dreams of destiny. Dreams that will change direction. Dreams that will lead to certain places that we need to go to. Dreams of provision. Dreams of, of career. Dreams of, of, of um, expansion and souls being saved and bodies being healed. I release it now. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ha. Ah. Ah. Ha. Wow. You see, now, the, I felt that went somewhere. Because just telling you that story gave you faith, didn't it? And you just believed it. And not only did you believe it, but you wanted it. Ha. Ah. Even tonight, Lord. Even tonight. Just keep the TV off tonight. <laughs> Go to sleep. Jacob awoke and surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob makes a vow. And he asks the Lord to bring him back to this place. And not only that, but to put him back in peace to his father's house. And he says, Lord, if you keep me on the way, I'll pay a tithe. You see, something good came down through the generation. Because Abraham tithed. And because Abraham tithed, Isaac tithed. And because Isaac tithed, Jacob is going to tithe as well. Because tithing releases everything that God spoke to him. I think if he withheld the tithe, you know what? This promise might not have taken place. But because he honored the tithe, passed down from his father, uh, from his grandfather, passed down from his father, and now into his life, you see, God says, test me in this. And will I not, for you, open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you won't be able to contain it? I'm going to talk to you tomorrow night about the wasted, the apparent wastage of God. The apparent wastage of God. 
And so you need to bring somebody with you tomorrow night, but come along yourself. Bring somebody with you because I'm going to release blessing tomorrow night. I'm going to release blessing that cannot be measured because that's the promise of God. Will I not pour out for you such a blessing that you won't even be able to contain it? I like Bethel. I like arriving at this certain place. I love when God does this for me. When it's just like right out of nowhere, woof, there it is. Incredible. I have a little 13-year-old girl. She's growing up fast. She's now a teenager. It's a bit frightening for me because it's a while since I've been through this phase, 20 years or so. And, uh, and she has special needs. We adopted her at birth, not knowing really, but committed to whatever need we would meet it in God. I didn't realize that actually her condition would cost thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. More than I would ever earn, more than I could ever find. The barrister, the lawyer, his fee is 2,000 pounds a day. And he's doing me a favor. When I picks up the phone, when I phone him, I never ask him, how are you doing? Are you having a nice day? I just say, are the papers I did? Thank you. I can't afford to talk to him. I can't afford to say, have a nice day. Even though it's very American and I should know these things, I just have to put the phone down. But I needed thousands. I needed thousands. This time last year, I needed thousands of pounds to fight my daughter's case to get her into the provision that I believed she needed for our future life. And while I was here last year, the Lord provided every, while I was doing the tour um, oh, this time last year, the Lord provided every penny that I needed, every penny that I needed. Outrageous, outrageous. When I got the bill, this is what happened. When I got the bill, the lawyer said, top London lawyer, he says, Mr. Gott, I know that you're a pastor, so I'm going to allow you to pay me with monthly payments. I said, forget it. How much? And I wrote the check, and I said, there it is. One payment, everything done. Outrageous outrageous and that's how God wants to be that's for tomorrow night but it's all that's what Bethel is all about but let me tell you something else whenever you see some there's a flip side and his journey doesn't end at Bethel he has to go through Laban's household and he has to go through testing of faith and everything and he Ends up with Leah when he worked for Rachel. And I never quite have worked out how that happened. Have you? Because if you have, then you can maybe tell me. What do they say in seminary? I mean, Laban slips Rachel at Leah in there on the wedding night, and he doesn't know. I've heard people say it was dark. I would know, even in the dark, I would know. Am I getting too personal, too much detail? You still want those night dreams? Of the right kind? I've heard some people say, well, they wore veils. That was their culture. What about the rest of her? I mean, it's a genuine question. I mean, as a Bible teacher, you should know this. I think he was just drunk. That's what I think. Just too much vino. That was it. So, so he goes through all of that. And he's on the run again. 
He's not on the run now from his brother. That's still there, active. He's on the run now from his uncle Laban. And Bethel isn't going to work anymore. And he arrives at a place that the Bible calls Peniel. And he puts his children, his wives, and his kids, and everything. He's, he's rich now. He's hugely rich. He's blessed beyond measure. And he's alone. And the Bible tells us that he wrestles with God. Is it Genesis 32? I think it is. Is it? Genesis 32. And he arose that night, verse 22. And he arose that night and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and he crossed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them and he sent them over to the brook and he sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man, capital M, I think this is God, do you? In the form of a man. I think we're theologically safe. A man wrestles with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. Now this is God saying to Jacob, just let go. Now, I've heard the devil say that. I've heard the devil say to me, it's not worth it. I've heard people say, you don't have to be as fanatical as you are. You don't have to be that radical. You know, calm down, Ken. Settle down. People have been telling me to do that for 20 years. Calm down. No. No. And if you think this is bad, I'm going to get worse. I've just told myself that. I'm not going to get better. I'll get better for you lot because you're like me. But I'm going to get really bad for them. I've heard people say, just let go. But I wonder if I've ever heard God say it to me. Just let go, because that's what was happening here. God was speaking to Jacob and said, you can give up if you want. I've blessed your life. You've got camels, you've got goats, you've got sheep, you've got men servants, women servants, you've got wives, you've got sons, you've got silver, you've got gold, you've got possessions beyond measure. Just let go. How easy would it have been to just let go. You see, I can hang on when I desperately need something. I'll hang on for dear life. I'll hang on until God comes through. But this guy had everything. He's the Bill Gates of his day. I mean, he's the richest man on planet Earth. And he's hanging on. So he's not hanging on for more sheep. Is he? It can it be. He's not hanging on for more camels, for more goats. He's not saying, when he says, I will not let go until you bless me, it's not possessions. <coughs> it's not more material wealth. It's not more wives. It's not more sons. It's not more children. There's a blessing from God that he's hanging on to that goes way beyond that stuff. Hallelujah. Now I know what that is. Because I pray for that more than I pray for the other stuff. Yeah, I do pray for a car and I do pray for a, something to get fixed in the house and I do pray for finances to come in and I do pray for that. But you know, sometimes I hang on to God because, and it's got nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. I'm hanging on because I want more of Him. I want to be blessed be, with more of Him. I want to be blessed with more of His presence. I want to be blessed with, with more of His glory. I want to, I want to be blessed with with, so that I can see more of Him and, and understand more of Him. I want to be blessed with greater revelation that I, I might love Him more fully. 
I'm hanging on for that. I'm not letting go because that's what I want beyond material wealth. And I, didn't, I don't have anything that Jacob had, but I'm not hanging on for any of that. I'm hanging on, Lord, and I'm hanging on, and I'm hanging on, and I'm hanging on until you bless me! Ha! Ah! Whoa! Ha! Ah. Whoa, she got up. Whoa, she got up. Whoa. I thank God for the open palm blessing. And I'll be speaking a lot about that tomorrow night. The open palm blessing of God when he says, here you are, kid. Have that. Have thousands and thousands of pounds to pay for your little girl to go to a, a good school. Just pay the check. There it is. Amazing. The overflow of that was that I went to a car dealer and I said, here is a check for that Mercedes right there. My wife got so carried away with that that she said, there's an Audi convertible right beside it. <laughs> I said, I saw that. She said, no, they're, 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 look, they're beside each other. One for you and one for me. <laughs> Paid. Overflow. I love it when that happens. I love it. Because it's easy. Thank you. What's hard about that? What's difficult about just saying, I'll take it. And I'll receive the blessing. And I'll rejoice in God. And I'll give him all the praise and all the glory because his hand provided. That's an easy one compared to penial. Do you pronounce it penial? Penial, penial. I'll say it's penial. So Bethel is this. Penial is, watch this. If Bethel is that, penial is this. Every now and again, when we reach out and we won't let go, God has to clench his fist. And it might mean a socket out of joint. It might be a wrestling all night long. It might be the voice of God himself saying, let go. Just let go. But you'll hear yourself saying, even in times of pain and discomfort, even in times where God himself is giving you a way out, you will hear yourself saying, no, I will not let go until I get what I want. I will not let go until you bless me. Elizabeth, wherever you are, Oh, there you are. Here's what happens, the overflow of that. See, when God says, have that for that, there's an overflow. I'll show you that tomorrow. You are coming back tomorrow, aren't you? The overflow, the overflow of this. Have you ever thought what it might be? The overflow of that is not really anything to do with anything material at all. It's God sorting out your life. That's the overflow. You see, he had a murderous brother. He had a brother who, for all of those years, how many years was it? Six, 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 and uh, 20. 20 years. Seven, seven, and six, wasn't it? Yes, seven for Rachel, seven for Leah, oh, and then six for his flock. 20 years. 20 years. Esau saying, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Now think about this. That means 20 years, this man, Jacob, is looking at the horizon for 20 years every day. 
looking for his brother coming with an army to take him out. Never ever fully at peace. Never ever fully at peace with himself. Always looking, always wondering, is this the day? Is this the day that he will find me? I want to tell you, sometimes we have secrets in our lives that nobody knows. And we have those thoughts. Is this the day I will be found out? Is this the day it will be uncovered? Is this the day when my life will change because that thing has caught up? That ticking time bomb is about to go off. Yeah. I've had seasons when I've lived like that. Jacob had 20 years. But one night of not letting go and wrestling with God took care of it in a second. See, the overflow of that is God fixing your life. When I saw that revelation, Glenn, it blessed me when the Lord showed me that. What's happening to Esau? I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I've got 400 men with me to do it because he's probably got an army of his own by now. I'm going to kill him. He took the birthright. He took the blessing. He's never going to live the minute and then he hears he's over there. And he gathers his army and he starts to ride towards him. But somewhere on the journey, his brother has a night of wrestling. And he's driving, saying, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And then he gets this thought, maybe I won't kill him. Maybe I'll just beat him up. Maybe I'll just give him a good, good licking. Is that an American term? Because it's not English. I just put it in there. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just do that. And so he rides on again and says, maybe I won't do that. I'll not kill him. I'll not beat him up. But I will tell him off. I'm going to tell him what I think of him. I'm going to tell him that he robbed me of everything. I'm going to make sure he knows how miserable my life has been these 20 years. And he rides a little bit further and he thinks, no. Maybe I'll just see how he's doing. Maybe I'll just say, it's cool. It's fine. Let's just part and live our lives. By the time he meets him, the Bible tells us that he falls on his neck. Can you believe? Can you believe in transformation? Can you believe that God can change the human heart? As you wrestle with him, hearts around you are being changed. Prodigals are coming home. They're saying, I'm sick of mom and dad. I'm staying away. I'm staying away. One night of wrestling... You know what? I think I'll go home. I miss mom's home cooking. And they don't know where that came from. And think, where did that come from? Because mom wrestled that night. A brother or a sister who hasn't talked to you for 20 years suddenly thinks, I think I'll pick the phone up. One night of wrestling. One night of wrestling, the overflow is God fixing your life, bringing it back into order. Esau falls on his neck and they start to fight. Do you know what they fight over? Who's going to bless who? Now they're fighting because one wants to bless, the other one wants to bless, and it's like, And Esau sees the wealth of Jacob. 
And he says, is this all yours? And actually, it was only half of it. But I think when he saw it, he probably thought, for a piece of meat. For a piece of meat. I gave up all of that, and he only saw the half. See, that generational iniquity should have been stopped so the twins, those twin boys never got it. It should have been stopped with the mother and it should have been stopped with the father. But because the parents let it run to the next generation, an iniquity of scheming and lying and cheating over here and an insatiable appetite, a carnal desire, for meat over here 20 years that cost them 20 years but God fixed it in a night Shabbat stand to your feet will you do that I won't let go until you bless me. I won't let go. The Lord is just telling me, and actually, I could have just said it and it would, it would fall anyway. But I, I heard the Lord say, say 20 years again. No, he said that to me to say. He said to me, say 20 years again. Not me telling you 20 years. Okay? He told me, say 20 years again, ago again. Because 20 years, when I said 20 years, when, I was, when we were counting those years, and Pastor Glenn said 20, something happened there. Right there in your spirit, something just went, mm, because you've been dealing with a 20-year deal. In your life count it back 20 years it's a relationship thing it's a pulling away there's hardly a day goes by that you don't think about it I want to tell you you came to a certain place tonight A certain place to hear this preacher talk about just getting a hold of God for something else and that will get fixed as an overflow I know there are prodigals that need to come home there always is I know there's prodigal sons there's prodigal daughters who are thinking and they just need their thoughts interjected by the Holy Spirit they need thoughts of home they need thoughts of mom and dad they need thoughts of the good times they need thoughts of actually a reason why they're doing it and, and concluding there's no reason at all two sisters haven't talked for years might not be 20 years but I just heard the Lord say say two sisters haven't talked for many many years I believe the Lord wants to, I know the Lord wants to do something about that Woo. whoa whoa I just heard the Lord say abandonment you see, sometimes it's the other way, prodigals, but then sometimes that just gets turned. And parents, actually, you have a prodigal parent. You just got left, abandoned. Wow, 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 wow. And you can worship with us, but I'm going to ask you a favor. 
when I come and pray for you, stop singing. Don't say anything. You know, it's hard to drink and speak at the same time, isn't it? You do one or the other. And I want you to drink. And so, as you feel me just coming to pray for you, just cut whatever you're saying. Not even praise the Lord, hallelujah, nothing, nothing at all. Because I want to pour in, I want the Lord to pour in. I'm asking the Lord to give you the tenacity and the desire to hang on. Not for wealth, but I do believe in prosperity, but not for that. Not for your new job tonight. Not for more camels or goats. Certainly not for more wives. Just for Him. I won't let go until you bless me. And I'm going to pray that prayer. You might not feel a thing. You might feel a lot. But just continue to worship until you f feel me near you or around you. And, and then just receive. I'll pray for everyone who wants prayer. And if you need to go, then please feel free to do that. You can come back tomorrow. And if you're at the front and you want to come back, then that's fine. Whoa, 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 whoa. When I pray for you, if you are connected with people just at that moment, just release your hands and let me pray for you individually. You can keep holding hands for now. When I, when I come. <laughs> are you related, you lot? What are you? What are you? Mom? Yeah. I don't need the whole family history. I just ask. <laughs> I asked. You're right. I did ask. I did ask. You just look like. You just look. Yeah. I would like to say it was a word of knowledge. You're all related, aren't you? You just look like. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. on and not let go and receive the overflow of that determination and de tenacity why don't you stand on the lines right now sing us a song Jesus Jesus I'm desperate for you Jesus I'm hungry for you Jesus 